All right, guys, what we're going to do is take a look at the very tired question, but also very interesting question that's been argued back and forth for a long time, but like, how old is the universe? How old is the Earth? Science class at school is going to tell you the universe is about 13.7 billion years old and the Earth is about 5 billion years old and humanity emerged on the Earth about 100,000 years ago. Well, the Bible seems to say something very different. And so people say, is your authority man's scientific knowledge, which changes from day to day and we can't be sure about, or is your authority God's everlasting word? Well, what I want to put to you in this video is that if you say that the earth is definitely 6,000 years old because the Bible says so, that your authority is man's traditions and it's not the Bible. Now, you may be asking, well, how in the world can you even, where does the Bible say how old the earth is? Well, it does, there is no passage, there is no verse, there is nothing in there that, like, it says the earth is this old. It never actually says that. What it says is, we've got this Genesis 1 where God creates everything, right? God makes the world, makes the universe, and then God, at the end of it, God makes humans. So, okay, if humans, you know, existed 100,000 years ago, then... How do you get 5 billion years into the first part of Genesis 1? Because it's got, like, days of creation. It's got creation days. You know, God makes light. He made, you know, darkness. We've got everything. God creates all these things. And then it takes six days. So six days is not 5 billion years. So that's a big part of where the problem is. If you're not familiar with the problem, I think most people are somewhat familiar with the problem. Now, the question is, okay, all right, well, these are days, so the Bible says 6,000 years. Not necessarily, how long are these days? These days might not be literal 24-hour days. You say, well, Ben, you're just, you know, being wishy-washy and, you know, changing things around. Not necessarily. The word list, this translated day, we'll go over here to Blue Letter Bible. I want to recommend this to look up words and, and all kind of cool stuff in the Bible. We've got it, the Blue Letter Bible in Genesis 1 and the NASB. All right, so we can click on Genesis 1-8 right here. All right, and we're scrolling down. And here's the word that's translated day. It's the Hebrew word yom. All right, this word was the only word in the entire like language back then for ancient Hebrew to like say an unspecified period of time there was no other word in the entire language so like if you wanted to say a 24-hour day it was the only word in the entire language to say that if you wanted to say something else it was you know just a period of time if you want to say a year a month you know an unspecified just time block like like an age and if you wanted to say an age an epic or an eon we have all those different words in English like it was the only word for that this was a long time ago, and this was a written language that only had two verb tenses, if I remember right. And some of the evidence for this, uh, well, let's just have a look at the next chapter. And you have to look at this in the NASB because the NIV kind of butchers it. It says, it, this is, refers back to the, the week of creation in Genesis 1. It says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heaven. And so it refers to that entire creation week of six days. It just refers to where God made everything. It's, it calls it one day. So there's some, you know, pretty straightforward and obvious evidence for what I'm talking about so that I'm not, you know, coming at you from left field with some kind of wacky, well, really, I know secret things you don't know. No, it's right there in the Bible. And if you want to go, uh, you know, it's right there. Although if you have an NIV, they translate a little differently where they say this is the count of the heavens and the earth when they were created, not in the day they were created, but when they were created. So it leaves out that little little factoid. And we can even go to uh, this website, Blue Their Bible, and it will very quickly, we can look up this word yom, it's translated as day here, and we can see like how it's translated in the King James. So like it's translated as day 2,000 times. But it's translated, they literally took that word and they wrote the word time as the translation for it. As the literal translation, 64 times, just as a, pi, a time period. So like right here, Genesis 4-3, in the process of time, in the process of yom, it came to pass, right? In the process of days, or day. You see, see, see how that works? 
And he said, Lo, it is yet high, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep and go and feed them. Genesis 29. Do you see? So, it's certainly, you know, the bottom line is like, it's possible that this word could mean age, epic, or eon. So, like, you could translate Genesis 1 as the first age, the second age, the third age. God creates this, the first age, second age, third age. So, you may be wondering, like, well, how in the world can I, like, look at the Bible and, like, understand what it means when it's, like, in this ancient language? Who even knows what they're talking about? Well, in that time, in that language, where you have one word that means multiple things, then you have to, like, put words around that word to communicate what you're talking about. And this is something that we do in everyday life all the time. This is actually a, a very common occurrence that's actually very familiar to you. And a very simple, very commonplace example is the, the English word love. So the English word love, if you say, I love you, versus I love Disney World, or if I love pie, you know, the words that are around the word love make the word love mean different things. Do you, do you understand that? Of course you do. So, like, this is kind of how it works with this, this word day. Now, we can take a look at this, and we read through this, and we say, you know, God said, here's verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Well, that certainly sounds like a normal 24-hour day. It's that little phrase there, and there was evening, and there was morning. It's literally more it's like day one. Okay. All right, that, I mean, it sounds like a 24-hour day, and I could see, you know, it would make sense to read it that way. But if you study this, if you take the time to, like, pay attention to things, you begin to see, like, some major domo flaws in this. So, like, if we skip over to Genesis 2, it talks about the seventh day. And it actually, the seventh day isn't in Genesis 1, but Genesis 2 starts and says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day... God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating he had done. And boom, right there, it leaves out, and there was evening and there was morning, day seven. It just left that off. That phrase for all of the other days signified the ending of that day, and that day was over, and then you start with the next day. Which would, you know, make sense. You know, and then it goes into this is the count of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In other words, like now that the earth has been created, you know, what's going on after that? Yada yada. But it doesn't do that. It just ends and just it just leaves you hanging. It doesn't have that. And so people have long interpreted the seventh day to still be going. And for good reason, because it says on the seventh day, God rested from creating, from all the work of creating. Well, God is still resting from his work of creating. So it's not unreasonable to think that his time period of resting is still going. Because God's, in which if, if the seventh day is God's period, time period of resting, then it's still going. All right? And it's clearly, this, this phrase that, that lets you know that the days end, each day ends, on all of the other days, it's left out right here. Furthermore, God, since God is clearly still resting from the, from the creating of the world, then if, if the seventh day is a literal 24 hour day, then like, was the seventh day only the beginning of God's rest period? In other words, like, it says here, God blessed the seventh day, he sanctified it, you know, and made it holy. Because on it he rested from all the work of creating he had done. So it's pretty important, pretty special. Well, What's so special about it? It's just, it's 99.9999999% of all days in history have been rest days where God wasn't creating the world. So, like, if the earth is 6,000 years old, then only six of those days are work days, and then the the rest of the days are rest days. So, what's so special about that first rest day? Is God, had, God blessing, like, the beginning of resting? There's, you know, like, what's so special about beginning rest? You know, God's, God's blessing the seventh day because on it he rested. So, that's kind of ad hoc. That's kind of like, if we want to say this is a 24 hour day, then we have to say that, like, God's making some statement here about it's so special when you start your vacation. You know, the vacation is not special, just starting it. Which is 
pretty ridiculous. Okay. That's just created to maintain this seventh day idea being 24 hours. Not to mention he didn't have the, the ending phrase there. All right. And, you know, you could come back and you could say, well, God, you know, the, the word rest just means he finished his work. And so that's why it's only a 24-hour day, because that's when he finished his work. But the problem is, it says, thus the heavens and the earth were completed. That was on the, day six was the day he finished the work. And it even, look at day six, it says, at the end of day six, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. So th that was the day that he finished the work. So he didn't, ha he didn't, you know, bless day six. All right, so he calls it very, very good, right? Well, very good. I think all the other ones he calls good. So anyway, um, I'm not the first person to interpret the seventh day as a long age, as clearly a long age. In fact, Augustine, writing, you know, 360 A.D. ish, which is a long time ago, like 1600 years ago, 1700 years ago, <laughs> um, wait, that's 1300 years ago. Wait, no, no. Yeah, 1300. Oh, nope, seven, 17, my bad. Anyway, Augustine saw the seventh day, I, and he wrote in his book Confessions towards the end there, he's, he calls it an eternal rest of God, that God's living in an eternal rest, and that one day we hope to enter that rest. And in fact, he's not the first to say that. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, and just look what it says. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, talking about God, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God said, so I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. He's quoting from a psalm there about his Sabbath rest. And then he goes on, he says, And yet his works, God's works, have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, They shall never enter my rest. So I mean, it's clear from here how this guy saw it. He's finished because on the seventh day he finished his resting. All right, and... Hebrews didn't have to say it that way. It's kind of obvious that the seventh day is still going. So the seventh day should be translated as an age. All right. And the text really goes out of its way to make that clear, especially with leaving out the ending phrase there and the fact that it's God's rest is still going and it wouldn't be, you know, just the first day of his rest that's so special. So these, these points make it clear. So, some young earth creationists come back on this, and they try to argue, and this is what they say. Uh, let's see. They say that, you know, the Hebrew work week is you work Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I mean, Friday, and then you don't work on Saturday. And so they say, you know, it doesn't make sense for the the Saturday to be like God's eternal rest or God's million-year rest or something because the Hebrews had to get back to work on Sunday. And it's like, yeah, but, I mean, the Hebrew week and the Hebrew Sabbath was just symbolic of God's work week, of God's creation week. I mean, the Hebrews also didn't create the earth every week. So, I mean, it's not going to be one for one the same. It's a, it's a symbol of what God did. Now, there is a theological implication to the seventh day being eternal. And it's simply that it speaks about divine providence. You know, if God is an all-knowing being who knows everything and has all power, then he doesn't ever, like, get surprised by anything. So, like, he, no matter, this is the old Calvinist concept of providence, that, like, no matter what happens, God already was ready for it and already provided something for it and was already, and already planned for it. So, like, no matter what happens, God already knew about that, and this God provided. That's proud providence. So, like, you can push that back, and you say, "Well, how far back does that go?" Well, literally, God could really just do one thing, and it would provide for every possible thing that would ever happen. He already thought about everything. So, God never has. God just you know does this one act in the beginning, and then God doesn't have to do any. He can just sit back and like everything works out the way He planned. You know, so God is eternally resting.
And so that's a deep theological concept that's communicated with this passage. Now, the important thing for us when it comes, you know, to this question of the length of the days, think about it like this. It says, you know, God creates light, separates light from the dark, yada, yada, yada. And there was evening in the morning, day one. God creates da, 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 da. And there was evening in the morning, day two. And there was evening and there was morning, day three. And there was evening and there was morning, day four. And there was evening and there was morning, day five. God creates da, 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 da. And there was evening and there was morning, day six. And then it's, by age seven, God had finished the work of creating. So, I mean, it really doesn't make sense. Like, clearly, we've demonstrated the seventh day is an age, and I'm not the first to say that. So, how in the world does it make sense? Like, if you've got a bunch of ducks in a row with a pig at the end, you don't go, you don't count them like this, duck one, duck two, duck three, duck four, duck five, duck six, and then you go pig seven. You know what I mean? So, right now, this is kind of a deal breaker for the idea that these are these are 24-hour days. Okay, this is kind of a deal breaker because the seventh day, if you're honest and you're honest about what the text says, you have to admit that it's a it's a it's an age, or, you know it's 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 all of human history. So like that's a long time, and it, and it's it's an unspecified period of time because it, every day it gets longer, <laughs> right? So if you're honest, you have to admit that. So we're not going to deal with any people who just, you know, super huge booty holes who, you know, won't admit that. And for this video, let's just let's just move forward. Because if you want to preserve your 24-hour view that, that the creation week is 24 hours, six days of creation, 24 hours each, then, like, what you have to do is you have to say, well, there's nothing in the text that, that says that they can't be 24 hours. Well, that's fair because... It's just an unspecified period of time, you know. There's nothing in there that necessarily they would all be just. We could all we could translate it the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, the sixth time, and the seventh time, and that would be just fine. Okay. So like, well, how long are they? Well, they there's no reason to think that they're all necessarily the same length, even though we got an idea. You know, the seventh one's pretty long. The other ones could be much shorter, or they could be much longer. Like they're just, just it's just unspecified. So you would look in the text for anything that like would specify how long they are. And so what people say is, well, this phrase in here that's at the end of each of these days that you know that day seven blatantly left off is and there was evening and there was morning day you know the first day or the day one and there was evening and there was morning the second day and there was evening and there was morning the third day. Well, that sounds like a a 24-hour day. So the the presence of that phrase makes you think, okay, well, that's a 24-hour day. Well, there's problems with that. We run the first problem we run into is like we say, you know, like here's the second day. God, God says, let there be vault between the waters, separate water from water. So God made the vault, separate the water from under the vault from the water above it, and God and it was so. And God God called the vault sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. So like. So God creates all this stuff, and then after that, there's an evening, and then after the evening, there's a morning, and then all of that's the second day, or the second age, or the, really properly the second the second time. So like, well, that sounds like you know the sun went down and God went to sleep, and in the morning in the morning the sun came up, and that was you know now was the next day. That's what it sounds like, right? I mean, that's how that reads, like. And there was evening. It was time to go to bed, God. And then God slept all night. And and then in the morning, God got back up and started working. You say, okay, well that's that makes sense. But the problem is, God didn't rest until the seventh day. So that kind of creates a problem. So what the young Earth creationists do is they say, all right. When it says, and there was evening and there was morning, it doesn't mean that that happened after what came before it. It just means at some point earlier in that day. Like, uh, for us, the day starts at midnight, and then we have a morning, then we have an evening, and then we get to midnight again, that's when it ends. So, like, at some point during that day, there was a morning and there was an evening. And so that's how they, you know, interpret that. Well, that, that sounds kind of ridiculous. Like, if we're going to start playing that game, and when it says... When it says like, and there was this, and there was that, like that that could just that just means at any point earlier there was this and there was that. Then like, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. In other words, like, sometimes the word then is put in there. So we look at the next day, 
And God said, let the water and the sky be gathered in one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God cried the dry ground land. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation. So then, you know, means clearly this happened after the thing before it. So if you start moving stuff around, it kind of messes all that up. So like, in other words, the way it, the way it comes, the way it comes in here is you've got and, 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 then, 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 and, 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 then, 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 and, 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 then, 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 and, 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 then, and, 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 then, and, and, then, like, it doesn't make sense to throw those thens in there. You see how, what I'm saying? So, I mean, that's, that's pretty ridiculous. Like, a simple reading of this text clearly is, and this, and that, and this, and that, that this is one thing happening after another. And there's no reason to think that, like, when it says, and there was evening and there was morning, it just means at some random point earlier. Because then you could start saying, like, when it, you know, it goes to the next day, and God said, let there be lights in the sky, you know, God creates the sun on the fourth day, like, and that could have been at any point earlier. If, they, if, if that's what that means. Um... And it kind of ruins the whole point of like having the numbers of the days in the first place, if you could do that. So, I think it's obvious to most people that this makes more sense to, you know, read this as one event happening after another. And so, what we run into, and, and the fact that he throws the word then in there every once in a while, you know, really drives that home. And so, what we run into is God's like taking little breaks every night. So, all right. God's resting every night. Well, okay, okay. Maybe that's not a huge problem. Maybe these are just little breaks, but like the seventh day is like the more important rest because he finished all the work. So that's like the big rest. All right. Well, the the major problem with that is like God's rest wouldn't have started on the seventh day. It would have started on the sixth night. And so God didn't, you know, in other words, like, God creates everything, and then he rests, and then he gets up and he rests, because now he's resting, but he was already resting all night. So you can see you can see the problem with that. So it doesn't make sense for God to have all these rests when he rests on the seventh day. So again, it comes back to this question of the seventh day, and since that's the day of God's rest, well, the proper interpretation of these must be that God did not rest every night. But clearly... It was a sequence of events. And so a proper interpretation of this really is evening just means that this time period stopped and then morning means that the next time period started. And in fact, the way it goes, and there was evening and there was morning, makes it sound like there was an evening and there was a morning and there was no time in between them. It was just boom. Which makes sense with the idea that God created the world. He didn't take breaks every night. He created the world... And he didn't take any breaks until he was done. And then when he was done, he took the, the ultimate rest. Okay. It's a way of demonstrating God's, you know, divine ability. Okay, well, all right. If you want to preserve your 24-hour view, I mean, it doesn't really make sense for God to rest every night. That's a major problem. And especially since the seventh day is God's day of rest. But he really finished the work, like, you know, and he was started resting on the sixth night. Okay. Um. <laughs> so that's a major problem. So... These, these evening and morning, this is not an addition of a nighttime. This is an instantaneous, which, which, which is like demonstrating God's incredible power and incredible ability. You can say, well, all right, these are still 24 hour days, but this evening and morning phrase, it has nothing that, you know, if you're going to be honest, you have to say, well, it has nothing. It doesn't mean that that's a, that's not part of the normal 24 hour day because that's instant. That's like an instantaneous switch over to the next day where God doesn't take a break. He just starts on the next thing. So like, you, if, there, if it's a 24 hour day, then you have to say that there was like an evening and a morning before that that just doesn't get mentioned. You see the problem? This is a pretty massive problem. So like, in other words, you have to say that like, these are normal 24 hour days, but there's a totally unmentioned night before the evening and morning phrase. You know, so, you know, God's creating all day and I guess he's creating all night, but it doesn't mention this night. And then it goes, and there was evening and there was morning, like there was a nighttime. Or an ending of one day and a beginning of the next. And, but they, they came after a night that's totally unmentioned. And remember, the text could have just said, God creates this, God creates that, God creates this, and God makes that, day one. 
God craze this, God craze that, God craze this, God craze that, day two. God craze this, God craze that, day three. You know what I mean? So like, he didn't have to put this evening and morning phrase in there. So when he, when he puts it in there, it kind of makes it unlikely that there was an evening and a morning, there was some other evening and morning before that that just isn't mentioned. The evening and morning for God's days are this special instantaneous switching over where God doesn't take any breaks until he's got everything done. So you see the issue. All right, and this is how, some people have interpreted these these creation days or the creation week as instantaneous because of this. I don't favor that interpretation. I don't see why God, you know, had to do it instantaneously. Um he could have taken as long or as short as he wanted. And since the seventh day is an age, it you know, there's there's no reason to think that it, these other days can't be. All right, so we see that. So in other words, like all right, the 24-hour view is pretty much demolished, but they have other arguments for the 24-hour view. And how they argue for it is really based on Genesis 3. This is and this is what they, you know, the young earth creationists call this the big clincher. This right here, this is absolutely the big absolutely the big thing, you know, the fall of of Adam and Eve in the garden where they eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge and they're in the garden of Eden. And that's when death enters the world. And so they say, you know, there's no death before the fall. And, the, and that, you know, they don't like the idea, that, like, you know, you, we've got dinosaurs who died of brain cancer. Like, that seems, what kind of God would create a world like that? What kind of God would create a world like that? And so they say that, you know, the if you believe in an old earth, you believe in an evil God who made a messed up world. Whereas if you believe in a young earth, you believe in a God who created a world that, like, didn't have any problems in it, and then man brought problems into the world with man's fall. Now, the problem with this idea is, the fundamental problem is it's just not biblical. So, if you look at Genesis 3, you know, they eat the fruit, and then, you know, Satan tricks them, and God says what's going to happen. We keep reading, and it, we look at the end of the chapter, it says, and the Lord God said, this man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground in which he had been taken. Okay, so, this is clear at the end of the chapter, and this gets left out all the time. It's the removal from the garden is why Adam's going to die. It's not some magical alteration to the earth. Rather, if he had stayed in the garden, he would have survived. And so, it says the Lord planted a garden in Eden, and it wasn't the whole earth. It makes that very clear in the previous chapter, where, you know, this garden, it talks about the heavens and the earth, and it says the Lord had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And he talks about, it talks about the geography, where this special place was. And then, when man's removed from it, the garden's still there. Adam just isn't allowed in the garden, and there's an angel to guard the garden. So, Adam's not going to die because the earth is magically altered because of what Adam did, but rather because he's not in the garden anymore. All right. And then, the other issue with this with this is, like, the young earth creationists are being kind of poo-poo heads because they want to say that, like, how could God allow all this evil that came, you know, for five billion years, animal species died, and there were massive extinctions. And how how dare God allow that? And it's like, yeah, but that's not a problem just for old Earth creationism. the 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 real question is, why would God allow evil in the first place? So this is a problem of evil question that everyone has to address, not just old Earth creationists. That's ridiculous, you know. And again, in the in the issue of God's providence, if God knew man would sin, then He could have prepared the earth to be the place, you know, in other words, like, Romans 18 tells us that, you know, eight, uh, not Romans 18, uh, Romans 8, verse 18, or 19 and 20, says that, you know, the earth with the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that it would be liberated from its bondage to decay. In other words, the world sucks to help you see your need for God. And so, 
God knew that we would sin, so maybe in his divine providence he prepared the earth for us to enter into it because we need a sucky earth to help us see how messed up we are on the inside. You know, and that 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 doesn't really a problem at all. And and in fact it's biblical because it's the removal from the garden that causes Adam and Eve to, you know, to wither and die. Not, you know, uh the, uh, uh, a cursing of the earth or a modification of the earth and all animal life on the earth. It, it, things work differently in the garden than they did outside of the garden. That is clear from the text. Okay. And all right. So the the last point we need to take a look at is Genesis five. People say, all right. Well, you've got this calculation of years. There's no way that you know. It's you know. Adam and Eve lived a hundred thousand years ago because if you calculate this up, this is how they get to six thousand years. Well, almost six thousand, right? This is how they we've got human history going back to you know, in other words, it goes Genesis five goes from Adam to the time of Noah, and what it does is it gives us these ages. And it says Adam lived a hundred and thirty and then he had this son. And his his uh then he lived eight hundred more years, and then he this was a total of nine hundred and thirty but we know when his son was born, and when how long his son had lived, 105, and he had a son. So we can calculate how long that guy lived till he had a kid, how long that guy lived till he had a kid, and we get you know how many years passed until the time of of Noah. And then in Genesis 11, we go from the time of Noah, or actually Noah's son Shem, and then we go all the way to the time of Abraham, or Abraham's dad Terah. And so Abraham, you know, is actually brought into world history. He lived in Ur, which is an ancient Babylonian city. So this kind of brings us from this archaic past of Adam to the time of Noah, but it gives us like a, a definite timeline of how long these people lived. And so we know, like, from this text, people say, well, that therefore we know, like, how long ago it was between Adam and Noah. And since Noah's are like a actual historical figure to some degree, or at least when he would have lived, when the time of the city of Ur is fairly certain, then like we can kind of get an idea about how long ago that was. Now, there are some problems with this. First of all, it's not uncommon if you look in the book of Ezra, and I don't have the chapter for you, and look in First Chronicles, you'll have to look it up. They, you can see that like. There's a genealogy given of the same people, you know, from this guy all the way to this guy. And in there, they skip like four or five guys who didn't really do anything important. And so, in the interest of writing space, on, and in the interest of paper and time copying this over and over again, sometimes they skip people. And you say, well, alright then. Maybe they skip people, but like, we're talking about condensing, you know, about 2,000 years down you know, and, ex and expanding that out to cover 100,000 years, that's a lot of skips. We're talking, some people calculate that you would have to add in 2,500 more people. And that, and a lot of young earth creationists just say, well, that's ridiculous. That's It's ridiculous to, to add in this many gaps. But I would put back to you that if you're trying to cover a long period of time, then the longer the period of time is, the more likely you are to put in, to skip pieces, to put in gaps. Because it's a longer period of time. Like if it really was 100,000 years, it would be a ridiculous amount of names to put in there. Like, you know, they guesstimate 2,500 names. That'd be like, that'd be r ridiculous if they went through this whole little spiel. When Seth lived 105 years, he began the father of Enosh. After he began the father of Enosh, he lived 807 years and had other sons and daughters. All three years, Seth lived in total 912 years. You go the blood, the blood, the blood, this guy, that guy, that guy. If, if, like, yeah, I, I would skip people if I was trying to cover that m amount of time. So that's not really, that's not really ridiculous. Um, and then the other issue is like, was this text even created for us to come up with like a number on how old the Earth is? Like, if that doesn't make any sense, you know, like if if that was it, it would just say how long you lived until the, he had a kid, you know. But then it goes into this extraneous information. After he had a, after he had a kid who lived 800 years, a total of 930 years. That, now that that's irrelevant to everything. Like that's just extraneous information. And the, and the point of this 
this whole thing with giving these genealogies and these ages probably is to let you know Abraham, who he traced his lineage back to Noah, and how and who he traced it through, and then who he traced it through back to Abraham. I mean, back to Adam, because Adam had two sons and a bad son and a good son. And so, if you go back in Genesis, it's it's clear that it's important, you know, the good you go through the good son, not the bad son, and and so it's establishing genealogical links, but it's also establishing that people's lifespans are getting shorter and shorter. And when they can have children seems to be earlier and earlier in life. So that seems to be really the point of the text, not to, you know, so you can do these backwards calculations. Not backwards, just, just calculate how old the earth is. All right. Um, and there's one other gigantic problem. And, you know, people look at this and we always look at Genesis 5. But if we look at Genesis 11, it's important because it, it brings you from Noah to, to uh, Abraham. And you get this guy, like, okay, so she, uh, Shem was one of Abraham's three sons, Shem, and he was on the ark with Abraham and his wife, and then the sons all had their three wives. He was on the ark with Abraham. All right, we look at how long it says he he became the father of Arphaxad two years after the flood. And he lived 500 years after that. Well, if you look at, you know, the next guy had a son at 30 years, 30, 35, 34, 30, 32, 30, 29 years. So, like, in other words, this guy, Shem, who was on the ark with Noah, he would have been alive at the same time of Abraham. He was a contemporary. Abraham would have been like, what's up, Shem? How was that flood? It, it doesn't really... I mean, it seems more like the the flood probably would have been in ancient history by the time of Abraham, like it would have been far back in the past. Um, furthermore, I mean, if we look at the evidence for the flood from around the world, there does seem to be a common legend of in this big flood from around the world. But even if you go back to the time of Abraham when they had the Epic of Gilgamesh in where Abraham lived and they had a story like the flood... It was, you know, it was in the ancient past. But that's not all. There's actually biblical evidence. So, this guy Peleg, he lived, and he actually died before the time of Abraham. Alright? So, because he only lived 209 years. And so, well, no, I, th well, I, th I don't know, but I'm pretty sure he would have been outlived by some of these guys on the flood, which is what's important. Well, if we go back to Genesis chapter 10, it talks about him. It talks about, you know, everyone who left the flood, left the ark. And uh, this guy Peleg is mentioned as, you know, a descendant of Shem. And uh, Peleg, it says, because in his time the earth was divided. Okay, so whatever this division of the earth is, it happened in the time of Peleg. Well, well may, wait a minute. It wouldn't have been divided in his time. Pretty much every one of these guys was alive whenever this happened. If, if Shem lived all the way to the time, if the, if the guy on the ark lived all the way to the time of Abraham, then they would have all they would have all made it you know what i mean like it it makes no sense it would have been during all of their times why name that guy peleg you know that that's pretty ridiculous and so again there's an important point for you uh with that you know i guess there's tons of other questions you could ask i've got other videos on my channel that deal with you know some of that stuff in genesis that were like why it was the sun created after plants, you know, and that kind of thing. And we take a look at that. That's not actually a problem. It actually is evidence for the Bible. And I promise you, just just take the time to listen. Um, and this this issue of like, well, these why did these people? Why did Adam live? You know, nine hundred years. Like that sounds ridiculous. You know, you've got Methuselah. He lived most right. He was nine hundred sixty-two years. No, no, no. He was even more. Nine hundred sixty-nine years. That's a long time. And people say, well, th these ages are ridiculous. You know, humans didn't live that long. And Well, 
I'm not one who feels the, an important need to like adjust these ages. You know, maybe, right? You know, it's maybe these people did live that long, but like there is actual evidence that these numbers are wrong. I, there's evidence that these numbers are wrong. Is a simple way to put it. Um, if you look at, there was a translation of the Bible before the New Testament was written called the Septuagint, where the where the Old Testament was translated into Greek in the 200s BC, the third century BC. Then the Latin Vulgate, the Latin translation, is in the fourth century AD, so the 300s. And then the actual the oldest known translation of the Bible that's not a translation of the Old Testament that's just in the original Hebrew, in the original language, dates from the 9th century A.D., which is in the 800s. So, like 800 A.D. versus 200 B.C. So you've got a translation into Greek. So obviously, I mean, the Hebrew version existed before, but our oldest copy is from 900 A.D. Of, of the Hebrew version, whereas we have a translation from the Hebrew that I, where the copies are older, where they da it dates back to 200 BC. So here's the point. The Latin and the Greek and the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew version we have, they all have different num like wildly different numbers in here. And a lot of people have done a lot of work on this, but the ancient Babylonians had a number system that wasn't based on tens like ours. It was based on sixes. And this is actually where we get uh, 24 hours in the day, which is, you know, four sets of six. At, you know, six and six make 12, 12 and 12 make 24. And this is why we have 60 seconds in a minute and 60, se you know, uh, 60 seconds in an hour, 60 minutes an hour, 60, you know, you get it. So, like, our whole concept, like, the word second is a Babylonian word. And so, it's possible that a goof was made by, you know, the transcribers. And that these ages, the, the evidence indicates that this is a really, really ancient uh, text that was passed down. And people who were transcribing it later thought, like, didn't read the numbers right. Didn't read the ages right. And so, if you, basically, if you own that six base system if you move the decimal over but not a not a decimal but a six base then you get ages that actually make a lot of sense like this guy lived 80 years you know in other words if you assume that like they were using the oldest known system of numbering that you know the Babylonians used when they were counting how much wheat they had it these numbers actually make a lot of sense so anyway we could talk about that more later but this video has dragged on long enough and I hopefully this will be the last time we make a video about the age of the earth